Welcome to Living Life. Uh, if you ever go up to a young child and if you offer them a choice between a piece of candy now and $100 next year, uh, more often than not, what do you think the child will pick? Uh, more often than not, the child will pick the piece of candy. You could even take the time to explain to the child that with the $100, you could buy so much more the following year. And yet I still guarantee that the child will still pick the small piece of candy now. Why? Because it's difficult for the child to look beyond his or her current situation. And is only focused on the now. And they can ask themselves, what can give me the greatest level of satisfaction right now? Now, though we are not children in our worldly pursuits, we're not actually too different. You know, focusing on what is only in front of us, pursuing what we think will give us the greatest amount of satisfaction now. In today's passage, we see the teacher, this wise and old author of the book of Ecclesiastes. He looks around, and that's exactly what he sees. He sees meaningless pursuits and wasted efforts. He sees evil and oppression and even says in verse 3 that perhaps it is better not to be born than to be able to witness all this evil, all this waste that is being done under the sun. And in a way, it's a very terribly depressing statement. Uh, but what he's actually saying is, he said when you I is just focused on what is right in front of you, it's actually impossible for you to see what's actually important. As in you lose the forest for the trees, as they say. Then what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to go beyond and be able to see beyond our own situations? Well, to find out, we have to read today's passage. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Again I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declare that the dead, who had already died, are happier than the living, who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. And I saw that all toil and all achievements spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Fools fold their hands and wound themselves. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Again I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Better a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who no longer knows how to heed a warning. The youth may have come from prison to the kingship, or he may have been born in poverty within his kingdom. I saw that all who lived and walked under the sun follow the youth, the king's successor. There was no end to all the people who were before them, but those who came later were not pleased with a successor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. In order to guard our hearts against these useless pursuits and meaningless things, uh, the teacher, the author, he tells us that the best way for us to guard our hearts against envy and against complaining is, is to not focus on those things, that our motivation has to be even greater than all of that. You know, he says in verse 4 in today's passage, And I saw all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What he's saying is, reason why we do all of this is often because of envy. And envy is a very dangerous sin. 
because it comes from us comparing our situations and what we have to others. And it's not just wanting those objects for ourselves, no. What he's saying is envy is actually worse because what we want is we want it for ourselves, yes, but we also want the other person not to have it. And it's actually a form of hate. It's hating the person because of what he or she has. So it's enough for us not to just have it for ourselves. We want to be the only person to actually have it. And the sad truth is, it's all meaningless because even if we succeed, it'll actually never be enough because our hearts will always want more. You know, recently there was a nationwide lottery that made the news because it was a $1.9 billion jackpot. That's B with a billion. You know, I was thinking, wow, wouldn't it be nice to win something with a B, a billion? Of course, right? But do you think that you'll actually be satisfied and content even if you win? You know, you will say, yeah, sure, I want so much money, right? But I guarantee you the answer is no. Because right away, what do they do? They take $900 million after that. And now you only have $1 billion instead of having $1.9 billion. And instead of thinking that I won a billion dollars, you're thinking, wow, I lost $900 million. But that's how twisted our mind works often. Now, when's the last time that you were envious of someone else? When's the last time that you compared your life with someone else's life, wanting what they had, thinking that you deserve it more somehow? You know what the teacher tells us today, that all of this is meaningless because eventually it has no worth. You know, when you look at the Gospels, Jesus tells the stories of the rich fool. Uh, this person, this rich fool had so much that he had to tear down his storage just to fit everything. He had to build a brand new storage. And his life was motivated by having more and more and more and storing all of those treasures for himself. And to that, Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, uh, you fool, the very night your life will be demanded from you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? What Jesus is saying is, all those pursuits, meaningless. But it's not just the warning that the teacher gives us in today's passage. There's actually a solution to all of that. He says in verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. And in verse 10, he says, if either of them falls down, one could help the other person. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. The answer that the teacher gives us today is community. And the answer that he gives us today is a community that's in love. So no longer are you motivated to store for yourself all of these treasures. Now your motivations go beyond that. It's for others. It's with others. It's through others. The key point is community here. That's what it means for us to live in faith and to be able to live in the Spirit. It means that we cannot be a Christian on our own. It's not possible. We need community and we need each other. And not only for practical reasons, because this is what the essence of what it means to live in the Spirit. It's just like God, right? God Himself, He's in community. The triune God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect community, three in one. And that's what we need to strive for. So instead of comparing myself to others, we need to reframe that question and say, hey, how can I provide for others? Instead of wanting what they have and allowing greed and envy to rule over me and my pursuits, it's thinking, hey, what is it that I can do to bless them? I pray that today, that all of us, we let go of our meaningless pursuits and instead allow the love of God and the love of others to reign in our lives. I pray that everyone here today is able to guard your hearts against envy and against comparing with one another. And I pray that everyone here today will be able to be motivated instead by love and thinking, what is it that I can do today to show my love to someone else? How can I be a part of community and join in what God is doing? What is it that God wants me to forgive, to work together, or to show my love to them? I pray that that be our prayer today. You know, recently we had a joint worship service in our church with the Korean ministry and the EM ministry. And if you think about it, when we come together for worship, it is a little bit inconvenient, right? Both sides are a little bit inconvenient. Both sides are a little bit less comfortable than usual. 
And yet what we see is when these two communities come together, that worship is even greater. We see a lot more love happening in the community. No matter what, we're more blessed. And we know that God was more pleased. And that's what happens when people come together in community. It protects us against envy and comparing ourselves, but it also brings God joy. I pray that we are able to be that community for someone today. Let us all pray. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you so much for giving us this message and just reminding us how meaningless uh, the worldly pursuits of our hearts usually are, Lord. Instead, we pray that you are able to reign over us, that we are able to truly love you with all that we have, and also take that love to be able to love our brothers and sisters. May we be a blessing unto everyone. We pray all this in Jesus' name.